sight, sound, waves. We've already discussed uh, frequency and period and amplitude and wavelength and, and the wave equation, V equals F lambda, so we understand generally how waves are, how they work and what the terminology is. But now what we have to do is look specifically at how those things apply to sound itself. And um, in order for sound to travel, um, we, we need to understand what, what the medium has to be. Remember, the medium is something that you, has to be there to vibrate. And so um, let's just begin by expressing sound as a compression wave, because that's what sound typically is. It's a compression wave, which is another word for, remember, a longitudinal wave. But a longitudinal wave and a transverse wave are really the same mathematical thing. So although they look a little different to us, mathematically we use the same kind of things to describe them. So. It's not like um, it's any real difference to worry about. And just, just to recall, we have a compression wave where you have a pressure or a compression and then a, a rarefaction, which is a stretched out region. So this is kind of how we sort of draw compression waves. And you can see on here, we have a compression here a little region here that's compressed, and so on. And we've already seen this. And then we have these other areas sort of in between where it's stretched out. Those are called the rare factions, remember? Rare factions. So you can imagine how an object that's vibrating would push on the air around it and make these little compressions. So that's kind of what we want to sort of draw a picture of now and get into our head. We're going to use the simple example of a tuning fork, which uh, common thing that you, use, you used to use them a lot uh, for tuning instruments and pianos and things. Nowadays, though, everything's gone electronic, so you don't really see this very often anymore. Um, but we'll, we'll use the picture of a tuning fork. All right, so if we draw ourselves a tuning fork, Just bring this up a little bit. Uh, the tuning fork has sort of two prongs like this. And when you strike the tuning fork, these prongs wiggle back and forth. So they begin to vibrate this way each one begins to vibrate back and forth. And every time they vibrate outwards, they push and create a compression in the air. And then when they vibrate back, that compression sort of gets pushed against the next air and creates it. And so this compression begins to travel outwards. And after a short time, it's traveled out. And then a rare fraction occurs behind it as the tuning fork vibrates the opposite way. And then the whole process repeats itself. So what happens is every time this fork moves, it creates a series of compressions and then rare fractions. Each compression is when it moves to the right, and each rare fraction is when it moves to the left. And that, of course, is a longitudinal wave. And this is how sound is transmitted. It's transmitted as compressions in the air around the, the tuning fork. So the tuning fork is a vibrating object, right? Vibrating object that's making the sound. But in order to it, for it uh, to be seen, in order for it to be or heard, I guess is a better word, in order for it to be heard, that has to be transmitted through the air. The air is the medium that the compression wave can travel through. If you were in outer space, and you hit the tuning fork, it would wiggle back and forth, but with no air around it, it wouldn't push anything. There'd be nothing to compress. So this entire wave phenomenon that's happening of compressed air wouldn't exist, and there would be no noise. Sound doesn't happen in space, because there's nothing to provide a medium for the wave to travel through, right? So that's essentially how we make sound waves. You can imagine all the different things we could vibrate, right? If I have a desktop, 
and I slam my hand down on the desk really hard. There's my hand. Then what happens is it makes the desk vibrate. Right? I'll do it here. It makes the desk vibrate. Now, it doesn't vibrate like a long time because the sound is very quick. It vibrates quickly and then stops. But during the time that it's making that noise, the desktop is vibrating up and down, which means all the air on top of the desk gets compressed. And then when it blows back down again, it makes a rarefaction and then a compression. And of course, that also happens on the bottom of the desk because there's air underneath it too. So we make these compression waves every time we bang something or cause it to shake or vibrate. That's pretty straightforward, right? In your throat, uh, let's see. Here's your mouth. So we'll draw a little thing here to show you the inside of your throat. In your mouth, there's your tongue, and so on, bottom of your chin, whatever. Uh, right here in your throat, there are these folds of skin that sort of attach with a sort of a seam down the middle, right? There's a, if you look down your throat in it with a scope, you'll see a, a sort of a wiggly line or a wiggly separation here. And, and on either side, there's a flap of skin. And they vibrate close together and they flap back and forth and shake. And what they do, of course, is as they shake and vibrate, they make pressure waves compressions and rarefactions that come out of your mouth. And this is the sound of your voice. So your voice is caused by a vibrating object. We don't have to hit it. We can use our muscles to shake our vocal cords, right? Our larynx. And then, of course, these pressure waves will make their way all the way through the air until they come to someone's ear. And inside the ear, they, they go in through that hole in your ear until they find your eardrum and then they make the eardrum shake as the comp as the pressure waves hit the eardrum and then that transfers through a series of little bones into a little seashell seashell shaped organ that has special hair cells in it we're going to learn about this later i'm going really fast those hair cells are connected to nerves and this is the process by which your ear is able to detect my voice we'll study the ear in more detail later, but for now, that's the idea. All I want you to realize now is that anything that vibrates can make a sound, right? Anything that shakes. So how come if we shake something slowly, we don't hear it? If you shake your hand up and down like some of you are doing, right? If I take my hand and I shake my hand up and down as fast as I can, well, the most I can shake is probably about two or three times a second, right? That's about the limit for human beings. Two to three times a second. Remember, that's the frequency, right? That's called hertz. A frequency of two to three hertz does make a sound. It makes compression waves that would travel out into the air in the same way as all the other things that vibrate. But our human ear is only tuned in to certain frequencies. Before you can hear it, before you can hear any kind of sound associated with the vibration, you would have to get about 20 hertz. And then you would start to hear this relatively low, very deep buzzing sound. Okay? Um, if, if it was 15 hertz, you wouldn't hear a thing. But it still does technically make a wave. So, you know... The old expression, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there, does it make a sound? Well, it does make pressure waves. Everything that vibrates makes pressure waves. But, of course, for humans, in order for there to be a sound, we have to hear it. So you could argue whether it's a sound or not. A physicist would say that all vibrating objects make sounds because sounds are just pressure waves in the air. And it's only because humans can just hear a few of them that we think that, you know, oh, that's not a sound. But it is. Your hand right now is making a sound when you wave it up and down. It's just that you can't hear it. Now, you can hear anything that's about 20 hertz all the way up to about 20,000 hertz. And we have a little machine I'm going to use later or tomorrow, and we're going to test our hearing, and we're going to see what that would sound like. Essentially, 
a, a low frequency means a low deep sound. But the higher, the faster the vibration gets, the higher the sound is. And so a high frequency would be a high sound. Mouse versus what? Elephant? Elephants actually make sounds that are below 20 hertz. They're called infrasound. There's deep, deep vibrations that we didn't even know about until we invented machines that could detect them because we can't hear them. Elephants make these very low sounds and they can communicate with these low sounds over many miles, which is pretty cool. They can actually essentially talk to each other two miles away by making these very deep sounds that we didn't even know about because our ears don't detect them. So 20,000 hertz is about the top. My voice right now that you hear is sort of a not, not very deep, not very high. That's probably right around 300 hertz, 200, maybe 100 to 300 vibrations a second, my vocal cords. Girl voices are a little bit higher. So when girls talk, it's kind of like 200 to 500 hertz, kind of up there like that. And if you're a soprano in the, uh, in the choir and you're like, oh, right, with these high sounds, you're looking at maybe upwards of 800 or 1,000 hertz. Right, very high pitch sounds. After that, it gets really weird. Because remember, we can hear up to 20,000, so what comes after that? Well, then you have all these really weird high pitch kind of buzzes and clicky sounds. Like the chirping of crickets is somewhere around four, five, maybe six, seven thousand hertz up in that area. And then above that, 10,000 hertz would be like a very annoying, almost like more like a, a scratchy buzz than a sound. And uh, we'll talk more about that and why humans have to listen to such terrible things and because they're annoying. Uh, but we'll talk about what makes them important later. For now, we just want to understand that the frequency of a sound determines how high or low it is. That's a very important thing. You would want to write that down somewhere. The frequency of a sound... Sound wave determines its pitch. Pitch is the word we use to describe whether it's high or low sounds. All right? And the frequency of a wave can be found by looking at it fairly easily, right? So if you take a wave that has a very short wavelength, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency. So if I draw transverse waves just to see them, if you were to draw this wave and you were to imagine this was water waves coming towards you and your face was right there, then as the water waves move towards you, they would hit your face and they would be like, you know, splash, 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 maybe one splash a second or so. But if the water was like this, Those would hit your face like splash, 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 maybe two or three or four a second. So the frequency of hitting your face is higher in this case and lower in this case. So when you look at a wave, if the wave is bunched up with very short lambdas, remember lambda is the wavelength? If there's a very short wavelength, that also would mean a high frequency. Slap, 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 splash, 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 splash. Whereas if the lambda is big, Okay, batteries are back. And uh, so the low frequency uh, wave versus the high frequency wave can sort of be determined by looking at the wavelength, right? And it doesn't matter how, how big the amplitude of the wave is up and down. All that matters is how close together the bumps are. Okay? All right. So if that's the case, if how close the bumps are together determines how high or low the sound is, what makes a sound louder? The loudness of a sound is determined by the amplitude of the wave. Is the amplitude of the wave. So a loud sound has a big amplitude. It's a very large vibration, right? And you can kind of imagine if I hit the desk very vigorously, bang, it vibrates more than if I just hit it slightly in a smaller, quieter way. So a, that's a loud sound. 
a quiet sound would have a sort of very low amplitude. It wouldn't be a very high bump. Quiet. So amplitude tells you how loud it is, and frequency tells you how high or low pitched the sound is. Two very important things to remember when we're talking about sound waves. Okay. Um, let's talk about how sound travels then, the traveling of sound in different mediums. Sound in different mediums. Well, imagine this. What would be the difference if you took a tuning fork like this and you made it vibrate like we just did in the air, but then you also had a tuning fork that was underwater? and you hit it underwater and made it vibrate. Well, in the top case, the wave that's produced will be pushing the air, right? And air molecules are pretty far apart. Air is less dense. So when you push on them, it would take a while. If you pushed on an air molecule right here, you'd have to wait for it to go all the way over there to push on the next one and meet, keep the pressure wave going. And then it would push on the next. So that would mean that this wave would be a little slower as it moved because the air molecules are further apart. But down in the water, water is more dense. The molecules are closer together. So if you shake this, it's going to hit a molecule and then very shortly hit another molecule. And so what would happen is the wave compression would be able to transfer itself from molecule to molecule much quicker. So the speed of sound waves are faster underwater than they are in the air. Slower in the air. Slower. So what we said before is that the speed of a wave depends on the medium. Remember we said that the other day. And the reason is because in a dense object where the molecules are closer together and you tap one, it'll bump into the next one very quickly, won't it? Because it's right beside it. Bang, 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 and it'll pass that vibration on like dominoes very fast. But if the molecules are far apart, it'll take a little bit longer to smash into your neighbor, which basically means you'll go slower. So we can say that sound travels faster in denser mediums or materials. Sound travels faster in denser materials or mediums. All right. So let's look at some different mediums. If we look at the medium and the speed of sound, we can find some interesting little numbers. So for instance, I'll make a little chart here. If sound is traveling through the air because you have you vibrated your tuning fork in the air, it will go, uh, I'm going to put approximate here, because it does change a little bit, and I'll tell you why. Uh, 340 meters per second. That's pretty fast. Okay, 340 meters per second. To give you some perspective, a bullet from a gun is usually somewhere around 900 to 1100 meters per second. So this is about a third of, as fast as a bullet. Still pretty darn fast, right? If you want to convert that to kilometers per hour, right, 340, if you uh, multiply by 3.6, that's about 1,200 kilometers per hour. That's how quickly those little compressions fly through the air when they come out of my mouth or when they come from the vibrating tuning fork or the slapping of the desk or whatever. All right, so that's air. If we think about water, water is more dense. And so the speed of sound in water is approximately somewhere around, oh, maybe 1,500, let's say. We'll round it off a bit, meters per second. So if you look at those numbers, it's just under five times faster. Five times faster in the water. So if you, if you scream underwater, your, the sound of your voice will travel faster than if you scream in the air. Right? Which is weird. So, 
I guess if someone's drowning and you want to get their attention, you should go underwater and scream because that'll get to them faster than screaming at them through the air. I don't know what you're going to scream, but, you know, swim or something. But, of course, if they're drowning, they probably can't swim, right? So, all right. Now, people can go underwater and we can live in the air. 99% of what people do is in the air because we need air to live. Uh, very few people live inside aluminum like encased in solid aluminum, unless you're Han Solo and you're living in, encased in carbonite. Remember Han Solo? You guys don't remember that. You're too young. Some of you do. Uh, people don't live inside. And even underwater, we have to hold our breath so we can't stay underwater very long. So most of the things humans do, the medium is air, and sound travels through the air, and we listen to it through our ears through the air. But it can travel underwater. And you can scream at people underwater. When you're a kid, I'm sure you did that, where you're swimming and they go, okay, let's go underwater and I'll scream. And we can all hear it. And then you scream and it sounds funny and you come up and you laugh, right? Did you do that when you were a kid? No, because you had Xbox. I didn't have Xbox, so I couldn't do that as a kid. I had, to do, I had to do this kind of thing, jump up and down in the water and scream. That's what we did as kids. Uh, let's look at, um, let's look at uh, glass. Sound can go through glass. We know this because if I stand outside the door and I yell at you, my voice will go through the air, then it will hit the door. And it will make the glass vibrate, and then the sound will go through the glass and into the air inside the classroom and then to your ears. But it won't be as loud, right? Because the glass is going to vibrate differently than the air. I could do an example, but then I'd have to go outside and scream. And then you'd like that, but I won't. You have to take my word for it. Oh, this is going to be about 5,000 meters per second. Very fast. See, because glass is much more dense. And then just to give you an idea, uh, we can put a couple more things on this chart just for fun. Um, iron. Right? If you were sort of encased in iron and you tried to scream and you could somehow vibrate, iron is pretty much the same as glass. And then aluminum. I want to do aluminum because we're going to do a little experiment later with aluminum, a little demonstration. It's about 5,100 meters per second. Very fast. Okay? Now, because humans live in the air, we're going to focus mostly on air, right? Um, I, I could tell you to go home and encase yourself in aluminum and test it out, but then you'd die and your parents would be upset. Well, we would think they might be upset. Depends how many kids they have, I guess. And whether or not you're the favorite, right? Uh, but let's talk about air, speed of sound in air. The problem with air is that it's not very um, uniform. A piece of iron is all the way through it pretty much the same. But air is a very fluffy, light gas, and it can become denser and less dense when you heat it up or, or cool it down. Right? Um, the air is never the same. The air in this room isn't quite the same as the air out in the hall. Maybe there's more humidity. Maybe it's a little warmer in here than out there. So, so air is quite variable. So the speed of sound in air is a little bit tricky. And one of the biggest things that affects how fast the sound goes is, of course, the temperature. So it varies with the temperature of the air. Now, you'll recall from grade 9, the kinetic molecular theory of matter, there are spaces between all part particles, everything's made of particles, the particles have energy, they vibrate, the more energy they have. Remember that little thing you had to learn and memorize? Well, when you heat things up, the molecules inside them shake around more, which means they take up a little more space, so they tend to spread out. So in a cold object, these little, op these little molecules would vibrate very close together, but as you warm them up, they'd have to spread out because they're vibrating more vigorously. It's kind of like if you've ever gone to a dance. I know you guys don't do that much anymore, but you know people will be dancing around. There's always these few people who like to really let loose and they start flailing and jumping all over the place. And what happens is when they start, the crowd automatically just kind of opens up and gives them space, partly because we think they're a little bit strange, and partly because they're going to punch us in the face with their flailing arms and legs if we don't back off. So these crazy dancers, they take up more space. 
and the crazy molecules vibrating when it's hot take up more space. Now remember what we said. If your molecules are further apart, then does the sound go faster or does it go slower? Hmm. Well, it turns out that even though you're further apart, because you're vibrating already, you're already shaking back and forth a lot, it doesn't take much of a push for you to shake into your neighbor. So typically what we see is we see the, temp the speed of sound actually go up when the temperature gets hotter. The sound will go a little faster as the air gets hotter because the heat is adding vibration to the molecules. And the sound is vibrating them. So if you add vibration, that only helps, right? And it makes it go faster. So as temperature rises, sound travels faster. And there's an actual mathematical relationship we can use to, to describe this. Uh, if you take uh, the speed of sound, speed of sound in the air will be uh, this sort of base number, 332 meters per second. And then we have to add to that 0 0.6 times whatever the temperature is. And the temperature is in degrees Celsius when we use this equation degrees Celsius, okay? Not Kelvins, which is what we often use in science. Temperature in degrees Celsius. So let's do some little exper or little uh, problems here. Let's say it's winter time and it's minus 20 degrees of very cold, right? This is Canada, minus 20. That's a, that's a nice winter day, actually. So the speed of sound traveling in the air would be 332 plus 0 0.6 times negative 20. You have to put the minus in. Minus counts. And then that would be, if you 332, and that would turn this into a minus, and that would be what? 12, right? 20 times 0. 0.6. So that would mean you'd subtract 12 from this, and you would get 320 meters per second. That's a bit slow. But likewise, if we did the same thing on a hot summer day, on a hot summer day, maybe it would be 30 degrees Celsius. That's probably about as hot as it gets in Canada. So then we would have 330, the speed would be 332 plus 0 0.6 T. So that would be 332 plus 0 0.6 times positive 30 degrees Celsius. So that's 332 plus, that would be about 18, right? And if I add 18 to that, it's 350 meters per second for the speed of sound in warm air. So look at the two numbers, and it's, that's a significant difference. That's a difference of 30 meters per second, which is about 100 kilometers an hour difference, just because of the temperature. So sometimes we have to account for the temperature of the air when we want to do questions and problems. But here's what I'm going to tell you. If you're reading a question, and the question mentions temperature, or it says that it's 20 degrees outside, that's going to be your clue that to figure out your speed of sound, you're going to have to do this little formula first. But what if the question is just talking generally about a sound wave, and there's nothing in the question that talks about how hot it is? What we really need is, a general number we can use that's going to be just kind of like the number we use all the time unless we're really serious about the temperature. You know what I mean? A number we can just kind of use as our, as our steady number. So let's take room temperature, which is a nice 20 degrees, and let's see what that comes out to. Positive 20 this, this time, right? 20 degrees, which is about what this room is right now, very close to it. So that's 332 plus 12, which is about 344 meters per second, which is pretty darn close to 340. So what I like to do is I like to say that unless the question specifically mentions or hints at temperature, and it, if you need a speed of sound, 
we're going to use the number 340 meters per second all the time. That's just a nice, easy way to deal with it. But if the question is talking about temperature, you can tell that it's leading you down the path of you have to figure it out for yourself. You wouldn't be able to use the 340, you'd have to figure it out. So 99% of the questions we are going to do, we're just going to use this because we're not going to bother doing this extra calculation. Right? So there you go. The speed of sound, 340 meters per second in air. It's obviously much faster in a lot of other things. And we also know that if there is a temperature involved, we can calculate the true speed of sound using that little formula from before. We're not going to worry too much about the sound, the speed of sound in aluminum or water right off the bat because that's not our human experience, right? Okay, so that will be the end of that video. As in